Uh, I have a friend here that showed up Wednesday. I haven't seen him probably for about 30 years, and he was sitting right behind me. And I welcomed him in, and I said, what's your name? And I noticed he had a Vietnam hat, and, I said, and he, he told me, Ed Mason. I said, you worked at the post office? He says, yeah. And I said, how'd you know? What do you, you're, this is Robert Perez. You don't remember me? He says, yeah, I came looking for you, but you used to have black hair. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. So, so God's still in the restoring business because he, rest, he restored an awesome friendship. Ed and his wife, Carmelita, we thank you guys for coming. You know what broke my heart, though, was that over 20-some years ago, I had, I, things happened into my life. I'll be preaching a little bit. The, the Lord had sent some locusts into my life, and my life was in shambles. I was a heavy in drug addiction, everything. And at the time, I, I had given up, and I, I handed my brother there. I, hand him, I handed him my study Bible. I said, I won't need this anymore. And I walked away from the Lord. I walked away from the Lord. And today, yes, Wednesday, he showed me the Bible that I gave him. And he's serving God right now. So even, even when we fail... Even when we're faithless, God is faithful. God is faithful. So that's just so exciting to me this morning. And I, I, Did everybody get a slip? I wanted you to fill out that slip and just put something on there that you want restored. And then I want you to put it in the offering basket, please. And then if you can bring the offering basket and you keep those prayer, that prayer sheet, uh, uh, the prayer of restoration, because we're going to pray that afterwards. But first, I'm going to go through some details of what God's Word tells us to do about restoration. He, he, God always has us. He always gives us promises, but he always gives us details of how he's going to meet his covenant promise. And this is a, a covenant promise is restoration. So would you fill those out, please, and, and bring them up here, uh, the ushers, when you're done. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to share your wonderful gospel, Father. I thank you for the cross of Calvary, Father. I thank you that you restored us, Father, once a a lost people, that you restored us back to your Father. Jesus, I thank you for going to that cross that day. Father, I pray that this message would go out with clarity and with understanding and under the unction of your Holy Spirit, O God. Use me this day, Father, to present your word in such a way that this congregation would understand and they would go to a a new level, another glory, O God. So, Father, I thank you for what's going to happen here in advance, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. God is so good. You ready? Here we go. You see, I wanted to share with you this morning and and answer me this. Has, has 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 the devil ever destroyed taken stolen disgraced disgraced you in any way took your freedom exhausted you or perhaps caused you to lose focus hear me now to lose focus by diverting your attention to something other than his kingdom and then this something cost you a lot of money heartache pain brokenness and most of all what it did is wasted your time if it wasted your time And all of these things that I mentioned, and you need to pay attention this morning because God has a tremendous promise for you, and it's found in the book of Joel. Turn with me this morning to Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And this is what the Word of God says. He says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, in the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. So I will restore to you the years. The NIV says I will repay you. I will repay you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. <coughs> restore. I passed out those papers because I want you to have a clear definition of what restore means. Restore means to bring back to the original state By rebuilding, by repairing, by remodeling, by reshaping, to bring back to health, to give give back to the original owner, to reinstate, to put back, to renovate, to refurbish, 
to reconstruct, to make better, and to heal. God wants to restore something this morning. Did you you all feel something out? Because God's going to restore something for you this morning. Can I have those? Because God is going to, I just want to pull out a few so we can sort of get the picture of what people are writing down and what God wants to, to restore. And, and there's no names on here, but we'll probably leave them here so we can, we can pray over them. It says here, God wants to restore our heat. I don't hope that's fire in you. The, the, fire, the Holy Ghost fire, God will definitely do that. Oh, here's my favorite one. God said, somebody put, God will restore my first love. Hmm, powerful. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Somebody needs their family and their marriage restored. Another one, marriage. God is big on marriage and family. My health. God can restore your health. My 71 Monte Carlo. <laughs> I, I don't know where that I don't know where that one came from. It's all right. We'll we'll spiritualize that. <laughs> but you get the picture. Restoration. And we're going to leave these up here because I, I gave you some uh, a, a prayer of restoration, and it's all scripture, and we're going to pray that at the end of my message. See, God's plans are to restore, not to destroy, or to tear down, or to divide, or to break up. That's the devil's plan. See, the very first plan. God ordained after the fall of man was the plan of restoration. This is the plan of salvation, which which is to restore man's relationship to God through his son, Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel. The good news is restoration. The God we serve is the king of restoration. That is his gift to a broken world and to a broken people. If you're saved this morning, then you have the answer for this broken world. You know, we all go through some things in life, and sometimes we we think we have it bad. Am Am I the only one? And there's an old saying that says, I complained I had no shoes until I saw the man next to me, and he had no feet. You see, there are times in our lives that we think that we have it bad. I have a problem because, you know, a lot of times when I'm not feeling well and I, I, I don't want to go to work, I have to, call, I, I have to call my boss. And I can't call my boss because she's on the way to radiation for the, for the second time. God's going to restore your house, sister. <laughs> you, you try calling in with a sore throat when your boss says that she's on the way to radiation. Never mind. How's your day, Monica? See, she keeps me going. She gives me hope. You see, we become upset, depressed. We become irritated or even bitter sometimes. We let these things bug us, eat at us. Then we come another, come, come across another person or family that has it harder than we do. I don't know about you, but there are times that I have to do a reality check just to see how blessed I am and remind myself where God has me at this very present time. I am blessed and grateful this morning. And I'm here to put the devil on blast because he is a liar. Because he, you know what, he, he, he's always telling me, you're going to lose this dream. That, this dream that you're living right now, you're going to lose it. He's always telling me, you know what, all that, the, back in the day, all that stuff you have, you should have more than you have by now. Because of what you did, you lost all of that. 
He tells me that I'm a loser and I'll never get back when, when, what I once had. You see, but when I allowed the devil, and I say when I allowed him to come in and to steal my family, my friends, my career, everything I owned, including cars and a house, I was homeless. But the one thing that I lost that I thought, no way I'll ever get this back, was this. The years that I lost living that lifestyle. Wasted time. How many have, some, have wasted some time in your life? I'm here to tell you this morning that God is in the restoring business. So if something is bugging you or bothering you right now, I can guarantee you it's not as bugging you as much as when the people in Joel's day were being invaded by the locusts in the land of Judah. You see, the locusts had, had, had completely wiped out the land. Once again, Judah had fallen into sin. Same, same old thing, pride rose up. They were doing great. The land was flourishing. The temple was running. The priest was operating. The crops were coming in. The economy was booming. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. How many know a whole nation can fall? You see what happened? The people back then, they began to kick it. They began to chill. Because after all, look at all that they had accomplished. Everything's going great. They forgot who had saved them, who, who had brought them out of Egypt. They lost focus. Other things had got their attention. Who am I preaching to this morning? They forgot their priorities of God being first, and they fell into sin. But look how good God is. He raised up a prophet named Joel, which means Jehovah is Yahweh God. He raised him up to share with his people and to explain to them what was going on and what they should be doing. Is there something this morning in your past that needs to be restored? Something that has been eating at you? Or perhaps you're feeling defeated this morning, set back, or you're not where you should be financially, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And here's a big one because this is always mine. Family restoration. Mm. You have family that is unsaved or backslidden. They're not here with you because they need restoration. I'm here to let you know that all the effort, hear me now, all the effort and all the time that you have put in to lead your family to the Lord, that it is not in vain. Because God tells his people through his prophet in 2.25, he said, I will restore the years the locust has eaten. I am not only going to, to give you a fresh start, but I will restore the years that were lost, the energy, time wasted. I'm going to bless you beyond your imagination. That is God's promise to us. In the first chapter of Joel, Joel arrives on the scene. The Jews have just experienced a time of devastation. If you get a chance, read chapter 1 and 2 of Joel. So the locusts have just devoured the land left. They left it barren. They killed everything in sight. Matter of fact, we were talking this morning that that's going on in Africa as we speak. Locusts are swarming in there that it's, it, you can't even see the sun, and they're killing the animals. They're killing everything right now. Just as, the day, just as in these days. The locusts ate everything in sight. There would be little to eat and drink. The country would collapse. The economy was wiped out. They were hurting physically. Food was scarce. Water contaminated. Animals dying. The land was barren. Spiritually, the temple was not in operation because there were no animals to sacrifice. Everything they work for is gone. Labor, time, energy all gone in a matter of weeks. There are 94 different kinds of locusts or grasshoppers. 
Here the Bible mentions four for a reason. And maybe some of you this morning can relate to these. <clears throat> Let me get it. You mind if I drink to that? Uh, hold on, throat. So there's 94 different kinds. The Bible mentions these four here. The palmer worm, which means one that gnaws, takes little bites, eats at the bark of the tree. How many know that sin does the same thing? The canker worm, which means the creeping one. This one comes under the doorway, through window seals. He's slick. He creeps in through old friends, through relationships. This one comes in through TV and music. A lot of us have canker worms in our home right now. Hello, somebody. I'm speaking to myself, too. Then they have the, calip- the caterpillar. The Hebrew word translated ca- calip- caterpillar means the stripping one. He strips away little by little until everything is gone. The locust means the storming one or the swarming one because the locusts, they come in like a flood. They move in like, they move in like one army in waves, first, gnaw- first the gnawing ones, taking little bites, then the stripping ones, Stripping little things away, taking away at every, They're just tearing, tearing at everything that is before them, gnawing and biting, biting and taking all these things away. Then comes the creeping one, the one that comes in through all the little openings that the first one made because he, he was gnawing and he was biting. So he left an opening. So he leaves an opening. Now here comes the creeping one. And then finally, they've made room. The swarming one comes in, and he wipes everything out. See, the Romans called them the burners of the field because when they came, it was like a fire sweeping through the land. Maybe there's been a problem, a, a challenge, or some type of difficulty that has swept through your life, also leaving nothing but ashes. But I'm here to tell you this morning, don't lose heart because God has a promise for you. This morning, you may feel you've been burned in a relationship, a family matter, maybe your children, maybe it's been ministry, your job, your finances, your health, your walk with the Lord. The burners of the field have came in. They've gnawed, they've bitten, they have swarmed, or they've crept in and stripped away everything, leaving nothing behind. I'm here to tell you this morning that we serve a God of restoration because he is here to rebuild, to repair, to put back, to bring back, to make better, and to heal whatever the locust has eaten. Imagine how Judah must have felt everything was destroyed. And even though at this time Joel was given Given a shadow, a foreshadow of things to come, the, the, the rapture of the church, the, the tribulation. But the people, they, they didn't want to know about all that. They wanted to know, how can we change our lives right now? How can we change what's going on? How can we live for today? More importantly, they were thinking, I don't want this to happen to my family and friends. How, what do I have to do to get them to heaven? How can I reach this, this lost and dying world? Everything that's going around here, how can I reach them with, the, with God's word? You see, there's one thing that, and there's a lot of things, I shouldn't say one thing, that Pastor and I have agreed on. That men and women that come behind this pulpit will preach the truth of God's word, which teaches you how to live in this world today without compromise. Without compromise. So Joel goes on to talk about the day of darkness that's covering the land. Let's read real quick here. Read uh, Joel 2, chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. These are the locusts that came in. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been seen, nor will there ever be any such after them. Even for many successive generations, you guys can correct me if you want, 
A fire devours, a fire devours before them and behind them. A flame burns, the land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, they, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire they, that devours the stumble like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people, somebody say that word, rise in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like, like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Every one of them marches in formation and they do not break the ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. tremble. The sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. That's the locust. That's what, that's what they were experiencing at this time. The locusts, the burners of the field. You know, in Proverbs 30, 27, the Bible says that, the, that there is a mystery about them because they have no leader. But they move in like an army, wave after wave. Gnawing, eating, swarming, creeping, and finally stripping away all that is before them. These people were devastated. The fields were burned. The sun was darkened. Who could stand before them? What were they going to do? I'm so glad you asked this morning because now I can finish the rest of my story. Our great and mighty God gave Joel this incredible promise to give to his people. After all the chaos and destruction, this is what... He said to his people, read, let's, let's put up Joel 2, 18 through 25. He said, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, hear this, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with, a fa with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul order will rise. Because he has done monstrous things, fear not, O land, but be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid. You beasts of the field, for the open pastures and, and springing up and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the, and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat. And the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. And here it is. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent you. Remember who sent that army. God said... God said, I sent the locust. Why did he send the locust? Because I needed to get your attention. You were going off track. You were headed in the wrong direction. You were headed toward eternal damnation. I love you. I could not allow you to continue. I sent them to bug you, to eat you, to strip you. I sent the locust, says the Lord. But he also states, I will also restore and repay to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Not only am I going to, to take you, and, and I'm going to restore you. I'm going to give you back lost time. Woo! It's a lot of years. 
I'm going to build up that which was broken. I'm going to clean up what you messed up. I will build up, build back bridges that have been destroyed. I'm going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. Not only a fresh start, but make up for what you have lost because of ignorance, because of bad choices, and even sin. The years that were lost, I'm going to give them back to you. All that energy that you put into living that sinful lifestyle, all that effort that you put into that bad relationship, that marriage that drained you, that job that kept you from church, that job that kept you from church, the drug and alcohol habit that took you away from the church, come on, the freedom you lost because of jail or prison. All that you put into the ministry and you were hurt. All time. All the time you have invested into praying for your children and trying to get them saved. I'm here to tell you this morning, don't give up. I'm about to restore your family. Oh, that deserves a good hallelujah and, and praise the Lord. But in order to tap into the promise of restoration, there are three conditions which must be met. The first one is found in Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Let's read that. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. He does want to do you harm. That's the first one. You see, in the Old Testament times, the people would tear their clothes to show their sorrow, their, their sorrow and their remorse. They'd throw dirt on them. They would be out in the public. They would be making a, 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 a public thing that, you know, this is what's wrong. And they, they would tear their clothes. So everybody knew that they were being remorseful. They were saying they were sorry. They were saying they messed up. You know what? But that's nothing but showtime. Lights, action, camera. How many here know this morning that the Lord doesn't want to be entertained? He doesn't need entertainment. He has all of us. He created all these characters here. He, we don't need to entertain them more than what we do. You know what the Lord wants? He wants true repentance. The Lord wants a, a, a circumcision of the heart, a brokenness that, that causes change. This is true repentance. He doesn't just want remorse, which means I'm sorry and I feel bad for, for what I've done. But in time, because in time, I'm probably going to do it again. Nobody's ever done that. Come on. He doesn't want regret, which means I'm sorry I got caught. And I will try harder next time not to get caught. Come on. That just reminds me of some bad times. I, don't, I better not go into it. My wife will get mad. But you, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> and I Probably the men, even some of the women can relate. How, how many remember in a relationship before you were saved, I hope, you made all these promises, never going to go out with the guys again. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit doing this. I'm going to quit doing that. And you're just there and there till she says, okay, come in. Right? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? Right? And then what happens? About three or four days later, back with the boys, back at the bar, back doing whatever you're doing. And I'm sure I could name a few women that do it too, but we'll keep it cool. <laughs> but you see what I mean? We do that with the Lord sometimes. We do that with the Lord. We say, Lord, forgive me, help me. I'll do this, undo that. And then three or four days later, we're, we're doing the same thing. That's not repentance. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants true repentance. And that's a military term, which means a, it means an about face. 
We were once moving in one direction, and now we're going in the opposite direction. You see, repentance can only start with confession. The Greek word for confession is, hold on now, homo legale, which means to speak the same. In other words, you agree with God and say the same thing about the sin you're in. I don't say it was a mistake. I don't say it was an error, a bad decision, or I don't even blame someone else. You take full responsibility. Lord, this is my problem. This is my sin. Have mercy on me. It's my attitude that is bad. This is my heart. Confession. It's just the, it, it, it's, it's what starts. It's just a start. It's not enough just to confess. It's not just enough to confess. There needs to be a turning away from sin. Confession is not whining. How many wow, wow we have here? It's not whining. In other words, you're going before the Lord because you got caught. And something or, or other things are going bad. And now you got this poor attitude. I got to go repent and I got to go before the Lord. And it wasn't my fault. Though. They made me do that. Or she, she drives me crazy, and that's why I went and did that. Or vice versa. You need to get to the heart of the issue and say this, I have sinned. I have rebelled against you, Father, taking full responsibility. This is confession. It's me, Lord. Help me. Forgive me. I know you have allowed these locusts into my life to show me that I've been wrong. Lord, I humble myself before you. I confess I will now go in the opposite direction. You know, many have come to these altars and did what I just talked about. Not true confession. They've come and cried. They've come and confessed. They've come and said, I'll never do it again. They, they, they've said this and this and this. And then they've walked out and, and one or two weeks later, they're doing the same thing that they lied to God here at the altar. Pastor speak, spoke on it about vows. If you're going to come to these altars and make a vow to God, I'd rather you do it and mean it and turn your life around. That is true confession. That is true repentance. And go and, and live a different life. Otherwise, don't waste your time lying to God. Don't come up here like showtime. Are you hearing me this morning? We have to have true repentance. That's what changed my life was true repentance. That's what changed a lot of miracles in here this morning was true repentance. Not regret, not remorse, but repentance. The next condition is found in Joel chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Concentrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather your peop the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to a reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? The King James Version says it's a solemn regathering. Blow the trumpet, the Lord says. Call my people to gather to seek my face. Bring them together in unity. Let them assemble. That's what we're doing this morning. We're assembling. Let them assemble. That's the second thing, repentance. And then assemble. Go to church. If you're saved this morning, then coming to church is not an option. Oh, I didn't get a lot of amens. Let me say that again. If you're saved this morning, coming to church is not an option or a choice you make when you wake up. It's a necessity. Christ gave himself for the church. He died for the church. My God. Come to church. From Genesis to Revelation, it talks about the church, the temple, the sanctuary. It was ordained of God. The church of, the, write this down. The church is his body, you and I. 
and his body must come together to function. I can't be running out there like a big toe by myself. That looked a little funny, huh? There goes Robert, and you just see this big toe running around. I need you all to complete the body. We need you all. We need you here because this makes the whole body. Then we are strong. Then we are able. Then we are capable to reach this community. But without all of you, I'm just a big toe or a big mouth running around. And some of you saw you bring is your, oh, never mind. You know, get the picture. We need to be here together. You see, God's people have gotten comfortable. That's what was going on back then. His people were getting comfortable. They were forsaking the assembly. After all, why'd they need to come to church? The crops, they were producing. They were doing good. Their borders, oh man, they were secure. They had big armies. The economy was booming. They're buying houses and ranchos and eating how do you say it? They were eating carne asada every day. <laughs> they were living good. They were living good. There was an abundance. They had it all. Why go to church? I can't even begin to count the number of men, women, and their family and marriages that have been devastated and destroyed by the locust because of a backslidden condition. And you know what the common denominator is? And everyone that we've talked to, they stop assembling with God's people. They stopped coming to church. That was the first thing they did. They either got angry with someone, disappointed in something, or they just got too busy to make church a priority. Hmm. Mm-mm. Well, that sword sure is sharp, but it works both ways. Because I didn't want to come to church this morning. My wife said, you got to preach. <laughs> Just being real. The flesh is the flesh. I get to come to church. Woo! I get to. These people, they were making excuses. Listen to what the Lord is saying. He said, blow the trumpet, the Lord say, says, and everyone is to be there. But the nursing mom said, oh, but my baby, I can't go because I'm nursing. The mother says, that's what the mother would say. But the Lord says, be there. We just got married. We're on our honeymoon, the groom says. The Lord says, be there. There are no exceptions. Nursing mothers, housewives, honeymooners, businessmen, elders of the church, sports fans, or workaholic. There are no excuses for you not to be in church as a priority. Woo. Somebody say preach it, Pastor Robert. The Lord is making a statement here. There are no exceptions, no excuses. Church is vital. It is your lifeline. It is clearly stated. In Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as at the matter of some, but exhorting one another, one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is approaching? Is he talking about Monday that I can't go? Is, what's he talking about? He's talking about the coming of Christ. As, are, are, are we seeing this more? That, that wants me to get to church. I want to be here worshiping when the rapture comes. Whoop! What happened to pastor? I want to see this whole church gone. We'll just have an empty church. And if we have an empty church, then we did our job. We got you there. Boy, but if I'm not there, I'm going to be... Never mind. Get the picture... We need each other. Because you cannot fight this battle alone. We need each other. There are no lone rangers in the house of God. Church, I need you. Pastor Alex, Sister Angie, I need you guys. Manuel and Evelyn, I need you guys. 
Honey, I need you. Steve and Mary, I need you. Every one of you that is sitting out there, I need you to be here. Not because of I'm saying I need you here so that we can be a body. We need you. We need to do this together as a church, as an assembly. That's why he says not forsaking the assembly. It is important. We need each other to fight the fight of faith. We need to assemble together so that we can pre prepare for the battle. We are all vital parts of the army God is putting together in the last days. How many believe that this morning? To fight back the plans of the enemy, to divide and conquer. This is the way we are going to, to bring in our lost families. If you've got lost family members, staying home is not going to bring them in. It's being here in church. You see, God is our Father, and as a parent, there's nothing more that pleases Him to see His family together. He can watch them interact. He can see how they're getting along or not. It's important to Him that we come together so that we can work things out. All through the Bible, people gathered together. Nobody stood alone. We must assemble together. Sometimes we'll bless each other, and other times we'll bug each other. Yeah, oh, come on, Sister Shiloh. It's all being part of the family. Back in the day when, back, and I'm talking to my day, that's a long time ago, but back in the day when dinner was served, the family all came together and we ate as a family. And if you were not there, you didn't eat. You missed out. Dinner was a time to talk to each other. Mom and dad were there to listen and to give advice, to laugh and to enjoy each other's com company. There was a bonding that took place at the dinner table back in my day. Our Father is calling us out this morning to come together, to come around the table for dinner. Sunday morning, we should be eating here. He wants to bond with us. We need to bond with each other. We need to plan strategies on how we're going to defeat the enemy. You see, our Father is calling out, out to us to gather around the table for dinner. And if you're not here, you're going to miss out. There must be a sincere repenting. There must be a solemn regathering. And my final point is a spiritual rejoicing. Turn to Joel 2.23. As the trumpet blew, oh, well, here we go, 223. As the trumpet blew, the people who gathered were surrounded. We get that? Here we go. Be, here, this is what he says. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Wow. What's he saying here? He's saying as a trumpet blew that the church came together, the people came together, even though they were surrounded by the, 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 the devastated crops, even though the, the, the vineyards were barren. And even though they had been devoured by the locusts. But what does the Lord say? He says, in faith, he says, I want you to rejoice because I've made a promise to you. And I want you to believe it as though it had come to pass. The people were gathering even though they were in devastation. Even though storm, things were going on in their life, the crops were gone. The church was shut down. But then God said to come together and rejoice. In faith, and you'll see it come to pass. We may not see in the natural, but God expects us to see into the supernatural. You see, every time I come to church, I see my son who's in prison. I see him sitting next to me. I see my daughter who's lost and is in her addiction on the street as I speak. I see you're here with me this morning. I see my unsaved, backslidden family members. 
I see them here in faith. God has given us the ability to see right through the storm, and that's what faith is. There are many ways to please God, but faith must always be a part of it. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The Word says, If I see it, the, the world says this, If I see it, I'll believe it. The Lord says, Believe it, and then you'll see it. Hmm. Paul wrote in, in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. In other words, I'm going to tell you over and over again to rejoice in the Lord. Believe the promise the Lord even before you see it worked out. We need to believe the, the, the promise of restoration for our families, for our lives. Because faith is the key ingredient to see God's blessing released. Believe and rejoice in the promise. God has promised to pay you back for all your years of trouble. He says, I will restore to you I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. I will not only give you a fresh start, but I will restore the years that you lost. It's your promise. We just got three conditions to meet. Will you stand with me this morning?